Can you please turn off your cell phones? <laughs> Nobody's laughing. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, we'll get started. So I think that the, the title of this session, um, first of all, this is my name. Um, I, uh, we chose this title thinking that there was going to be a lot of different sciences and then we were going to come specifically talk about life sciences and why um, it's important to study it in, in, in great detail and great diversity. As it turns out this morning, I think it seems like almost all of the sessions focused already on life sciences. <laughs> so this is uh, maybe a little bit redundant, but um, I think what we're going to do in this session is for three different panelists to give a view touching a little bit upon their science, their particular brand of science, particular science that they do, but also sort of globally talking about the different kinds of life sciences. So I want you to think, uh, before I uh, turn this over to the first speaker, I want you to just think of a day in your life as you get up, brush your teeth, hopefully, and have breakfast. You've already, you've already basically you know, gone through many things where you know, life sciences, biological, uh, you know, creatures, right, have played a role in your, in your day already, right? There's microbes all over the place. First of all, it's when you wake up, I mean, the entire sleep-wake cycle is a biological phenomenon driven by the curiosity of us having a 24-hour day. So you have circadian rhythms. So that already there's something in your, in your life. There's, you know, microbes. Food that you eat, obviously that's life, right? I mean, we've heard all about agriculture. So you get up, you walk around, basically this life all around, you're not going to have oxygen to breathe otherwise. So you go and then maybe you, are, you see uh, know, mosquitoes on the way. So there again, you have disease vectors, there's insects. So there's something to do with biomedical sciences and you know, uh, illnesses uh, and so on, right? Every part of your life, you can, you can think about everything from single cells to your own body, if you will, which is what most of us care about most of the time, unfortunately, plus also the ecosystem within which we're embedded in. I mean, you're not, you're not alone. Everything, right? This is basically staring at us every day, and most of us probably internalized it and don't pay attention. But study of life sciences, I think you can sort of justify it at every, every possible way, right? Everything from studying single cells and how you know, cells work, how genes work, how proteins work, all the way to how the entire ecosystem works. I will make one small editorial note, and I think you can throw stones or tomatoes at me. Many people said, okay, we should do basic science. Everybody, I think, kind of defended it. Applied science, how can you not defend it? And then there was a compromise saying, look, we should do basic science, which seems relevant. Who decides what's relevant? How do you know what's relevant? If you already knew what was relevant to cure the world, everybody will be working on it. The very point of basic science to me is that we don't know exactly what is relevant. It would be nice if you knew what is relevant and we will study that. So I just want you to think, of course, you know, you're going to, you have different views, but you just have to sustain a system where you're just doing curiosity to different science, even if 100 people tell you it's irrelevant, because you don't know. I don't think semiconductors were invented because people knew what was relevant. You know, I, so there are many, many, many examples of this. So let's keep that in mind. With that, I think with that little editorial note, let me actually invite the first speaker, Sanjeev Galande, from ISER Pune to, uh, to start the proceedings. Thank you, Venki, for this uh, introductory note and also uh, championing the cause of basic science. Uh, so why study life sciences? Uh, if I can have the <laughs> yes. So other than the obvious uh, practical uses of life science, which uh, Venki and all the previous speakers also alluded to, I thought I'll uh, uh, just start with some of the deeper questions that we can ask with the studies of life science. And life sciences actually empower us to ask some of the very deeper questions as to where did we come from, who we are, what is the basis of our existence. And these are really some very meaningful questions that you can ask using various tools in life sciences. What is our place in the natural world, which is also very important and some of the other speakers will also uh, talk about this. And as we, as uh, a unique species, the Homo sapiens, are we really that unique? And I'm also gonna talk about uh, this in a little bit. So uh, life sciences actually provides us the uh, uh, common platform to understand what is the common thread of life, which is shown here in this beautiful cartoon 
the molecule of DNA and the proteins that associate with that to form the chromatin complex. And this happens to be the most, uh, I would say, uh, well decorated and world, most researched molecule, if you will. So as being a common thread of life, this basically uh, sort of provides a platform where we can equate ourselves with all the species. We also know that the uh, species that live around us, plants, animals, microbes, they are somehow related to us, and some of them are actually the species from whom we originated. So it's, it's actually a rather humbling experience that we all share this kind of a common thread. And we can also go back millions of years, billions of years, and actually realize that all of us originated from some kind of stellar dust which actually came about. And uh, there are researchers in astrobiology which actually tell you how the original composition of the matter and the planetary uh, dust actually formed these building blocks of life which came together to produce this beautifully self-replicating model of life which basically brought about life on this planet, which happens to be a freak accident, but actually it's a very kind of a unique design of nature. And because of this particular beautiful aspect about nature, um, many of the other disciplines, especially physicists and chemists, and also engineers have been attracted to life sciences, and which is something very unique because they, all of them have contributed immensely towards the growth of life sciences, as very beautifully put by one of the uh, eminent physicists, Schrodinger, in his book, What is Life? How can the events in space and time, which take place within the spatial boundary of living organisms, be accounted for by physics and chemistry? So this is the question that he asked. And he also uh, eventually later in his life started working up on problems in life sciences. So did many other uh, legendary physicists and chemists. Nothing in biology actually makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is a very famous statement made by uh, Dobzhansky, who was a naturalist. And uh, he basically said that seen in the light of evolution, biology is perhaps intellectually the most satisfying and inspiring science. And without the evolutionary light, it becomes just a pile of uh, facts, curious facts. So just to uh, kind of illustrate this principle, I'm gonna show you one experiment, which is, happens to be one of my most favorite experiments in biology. This actually is a video that I'm gonna uh, show you of a mutant in Drosophila, the fruit fly. What you'll see in the wild labeled with the red is a mutant, and the one with the, uh, on the right-hand side with the green color tape is the wild type, the normal, so-called normal fruit fly, and they're in this wild. And as you play this movie, you'll see that the temperature on the left-hand side, you'll see the temperature rising over here in this dial. And what it actually basically does is looks for a phenotype, the characteristic of this particular flies. The mutants actually have mutation in one particular residue of a protein. And uh, in my mind, this happens to be one of the most, I would say, illustrative examples, a very beautiful example of everything that we know in biology. How can activity of a protein, which is dictated by the three-dimensional structure of the protein, which is through the protein folding, if it goes haywire, which in this case, the rise in the temperature is gonna do, and the protein misfolds, so obviously it's not gonna function anymore, and because of this most misfolded protein, a particular component in the cell, which is a synaptic vesicle, is not functioning anymore, as it's supposed to do, and because of that, there is no synaptic transmission, everything, goes haywire and the flies actually fall down, they actually go into a paralytic attack. As you can see on the left hand side, the vial actually shows that most of the flies, in, uh, rather all the flies in this mutant are paralytic, they fall down, they can no longer fly or crawl. And the beauty is this entire thing is reversible, okay? So you can see that now at the end of this heat shock, the flies are paralyzed, they can no longer get up and you can see that the wild type flies are doing fine and Within 10, 20, 30 minutes of recovery, slowly you'll find that these flies actually get back, okay, on their feet. So it's again a beautiful demonstration of how individual molecules can dictate such larger functions in a living being. So it basically summarizes, or rather epitomizes everything that we know in biology in terms of dictating functions through small molecular attributes. I'm gonna spend a few minutes on talking about the genomics revolution because that is closer to my heart. This is where actually, uh, uh, this is our bread and butter in my lab. So uh, genomics has gone through a great 
revolution, technological revolution, multiple breakthroughs have happened. And what we call now as the next generation sequencing technology has actually contributed immensely over the last decade in terms of our understanding of genomes, of species, and of functions of human beings. So uh, this is one of the uh, pictures of the earlier next generation sequencer. Uh, it's uh, basically six by five feet. So it's a huge mammoth instrument. And this itself has it basically technological revolutions in fluidics, optics, computing, and everything, what, everything put together in this machine, which used to be pretty large. The technological revolution has uh, continued, and now the new, the, ne uh, the latest next generation sequencer, which is, I would say, the fourth generation of these sequencers, <laughs> looks something like this. I mean, it actually fits into the palm of your hand. Uh, this is something where you can actually use this, and with a USB, USB 3 cable, you connect it to your laptop, and in real time, you can actually see the sequences being downloaded on your computer as it is being sequenced through a nanopore a very tiny pore through the DNA molecule is actually threaded through that pore. So it's real-time sequencing of molecules. So you can see that now because of invention of these kind of technologies, uh, the, there is a possibility of personalized medicine. I'm sure within five years from now, all of you will have your own genomes in a stick in your pocket, and when you go visit your physician, he takes that particular stick and tells you what kind of medicine is gonna work for you and not for someone else. So that kind of technology is feasible because of inventions like these. And if you look at how this technology actually has evolved over years, it has actually even beaten the Moore's law. The cost of sequencing has dro uh, dropped dramatically after the invention of the next generation sequencing technologies. The Human Genome Project cost billions of dollars over uh, more than a decade, hundreds of scientists f are working together. And now uh, people are talking about $100 genomes in tiny labs. Okay, one person can actually uh, deduce a sequence using smaller sequences like these. Another technological invention that actually went into this revolution of genomics is the uh, invention of the algorithms and the modeling that actually went into stitching the sequences together to give rise to genomes. The way in which the sequences are actually uh, brought out by the machines is very sh uh, similar to shredding of a book. Okay, so what you see here is, is almost like you take a book, put it through a shredder, and generate all these shreds, and then do reverse of that, okay? Imagine how complex this task is. And that is where a large number of mathematicians, statisticians, and engineers have actually contributed in a great way to assist, assist the uh, complex task of assembling genomes using strings of information. And that's the beauty of life sciences, that there is so much that all other fields have contributed in terms of our understanding of the process of life. I'm gonna just briefly talk about two applications of this genomics wave, and one of them is the microbiome. Uh, Vicky just talked about brushing teeth. That's where we encounter our microbes for the first time, and then of course the entire gut is full of microbes. And if you see the numbers, which I'll give you in the next slide, is staggering. We have probably as many number of uh, microbes in our body as our own cells. So the question is really, what is it human? I mean, are our cells the so-called human cells make us human, or is it something else in addition to that that actually puts together us as a being? And that's a really big question that people are still trying to understand. So this is what happens. So because of revolution of health science, over the last century, you can see that uh, the number of infectious diseases has dropped, which is what is shown in the left-hand side graph. And on the right-hand side, you will see that concomitant to this decrease in the infectious disease, there is an increase in the autoimmune disorders, the so-called disease of the modern lifestyle, okay? So it's, it's really alarming, and it's quite stark to notice that the dip in infectious disease corresponds with the increase in so-called modern uh, or the allergic autoimmune disorders. And that is because of the challenge of the microbiome. The disturbance is important, not just in disease, but also in dictating something as complex as behavior of the species. So you can see uh, in the gut, for example, the uh, um, diagram from Scientific American uh, on the right-hand side shows that humans have just about 25,000 genes or less in each cell, and if you put together the, uh, the number of genes from all the species that are in our gut, that's over three million, okay? So it's, look at the genetic imbalance, it's huge. So that's, that's really uh, uh, alluding to the question, what is it that makes us what we are? Is it only our genes or 
the gene and other con products made by somebody else residing in our body. And the other application I'm going to uh, talk about is one of the most recent applications of genomics technology, which is the single cell biology. And this is what is redefining almost everything in biology. And this new field is allowing us to ask questions to understand the heterogeneity of cells. Cells that normally look alike actually have a lot of heterogeneity within them. And that heterogeneity is important for the function of a living being. Okay, so uh, cell theory in the uh, a couple of centuries ago uh, helped us to understand cell as a building block of life. But now, single cell biology is taking one leap further and it's enabling us to understand cells not just being the building blocks of life, but also are as entities that can add to the diversity of life and also to the phenotypic diversity of life. So as an example of that, I want to show you one of these most recent uh, publications which actually talked about embryonic development in fish. Each and every stage, as you can see the beautiful tree up there, it's a different kind of a tree. It's a tree of development. How various different types of cells dictate the fate of an organism very early in life. And this is possible through the power of single cell biology. The evolution continues and our change in lifestyle actually has contributed to the way in which we continue to evolve. Another question. And that is where the interaction of our genome, our body, our cells with the environment comes into picture. So people are now talking about the epigenetic wave of understanding life within life. The, uh, early life experiences as seen in the womb of a mother, the dietary changes, the environmental changes, cultural and many other factors that add to building of a human being very early, from very early stages to the late adulthood. And that is the most interesting and emerging aspect of life sciences that uh, is exciting most of the biologists as well as people in other disciplines. So I'll stop here and I guess uh, move on to other people. Thank you. Hold all your wonderful questions until we sort of have uh, the three speakers rotate through and then you can ask us. Uh, the next up is Uma Ramakrishnan from NCBS Bangalore. Thank thanks uh, all for coming and uh, thanks, for, thanks for inviting me. So it was really uh, wonderful to hear about this spectrum, which is biology. Um, I think uh, what's really important when thinking about science itself uh, is this idea of wonder, right? I think we all become curious about things in science because we're curious about how things work. And to me, uh, that curiosity uh, or that sense of wonder is nowhere more pronounced than in the midst of nature, on a trek in the Himalayas or in a forest, you know, watching the insects around you and thinking, why are there more insects in the Himalayas than there are in the Central Indian Plains? Why are there more species in some places than in others? These may just seem like very basic questions, and they may seem like you know walks of a naturalist or a idle uh, you know person of leisure, as maybe you know Darwin was right to some extent. Uh, in the past, people of leisure had the opportunity to uh, investigate such things or ask such questions, uh, and they may seem to have nothing to do with technologies, like um, Sanjeev talked about, you know, genomics. But actually, this is not true today. Um, I guess I said two things. One is that this is a very exclusive activity, and the other is it has nothing to do with technology. Uh, I think that today we are beginning to understand biodiversity in a very different way because we have the power of genomics. We can actually, for example, work we do in our lab, extract DNA from a single hair of a tiger and sequence its genome. We can understand who that tiger is related to. Are there effects of inbreeding on these individuals? How should we manage these populations so that tigers survive in the future? So this understanding of nature, this deconstruction of nature, is critical to our ability to steward nature into the future. Uh, we've all, we all hear such negative things about the environment, right? Climate change, biodiversity loss, it's all gloom and doom. But I feel that our understanding of how nature functions in terms of individuals, species, interactions between species, how this varies across space and time, uh, 
this understanding will be critical in our ability to deal with the challenges of the future. Uh, some new technologies, like I mentioned, genomics, we are able to now uh, sequence environmental DNA, collect a sample of water and figure out what fish lived in that area. And these are great opportunities to do local science, to have students engage in this nanopore sequencer, figuring out things from the Himalayas to the Western Ghats in a very local efforts so that science feels around you versus somewhere in Europe or elsewhere in the world where it seems to have happened. I'd also like to bring up uh, some new technologies with respect to uh, studies on climate change. Uh, so LIDAR technologies uh, today provide us this ability to get very high resolution understandings of forests and canopy. And this allows us to understand things about carbon stocks, where carbon is sequestered in our environment, how the planet is changing. These trends of urbanization we heard about, we heard about them in the context of sustainability, but they have tremendous consequences on our environment. And uh, Professor Vijayaraghavan mentioned how we should have an inclusive and sustainable approach to development. But this kind, these kinds of trends, these demographic trends of people moving to cities, changes in agricultural practices, all have signatures on the land. And we need to be able to understand how our earth is changing in order to mitigate uh, any kind of negative effects we can have in the context of this uh, development. So um, yeah, I guess that's, that's all I have to say. Thanks. <laughs> Next we'll have uh, Yamuna Krishnan from uh, the University of Chicago. Sorry, give me a minute uh, as I try and see if I can interface my laptop. Um. Um, I wonder whether it's possible to project yeah. whatever. Yeah, I, yeah. yeah. okay. So. Um, I just wanted to see it was working. So I, before I start, I just want to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to this really exciting initiative. Um, and uh, I want to start by asking all of you a question. Uh, by a show of hands, um, uh, just raise your hand if you've ever come across, or you have been that kid, or you've ever come across a, a kid. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm fine with this. Yes, I'm actually okay with this. I deliberately turned the screen off. It works. It, it works. Kaam karta hai. Okay. So, um, uh, by a show of hands, I just want you to uh, uh, put up your hand if you know of a kid or you have ever been that kid who has uh, pestered a grown up with uh, questions like, you know, why is the sky blue? Why is the water blue? Why is my blood red? Uh, yeah. Okay. Great. Including our panel member. Uh, okay, so uh, this just goes to show that we are all born basic scientists, okay? Uh, every one of us has that inherent curiosity about the world around us. This is something fundamental to human nature. And most of us as kids, we go to school and we have that curiosity beaten out of us. Uh, okay, some of us are so stubborn we continue asking those questions, and then we end up like Uma and Sanjeev and Vinky. Uh, okay, so that is the only difference. Uh, and so I, I feel that if you are not, th this is what makes us different from birds uh, and our pets, that we want to know what uh, something is and why something is the way it is. Uh, and tell me, uh, I mean, I, I can tell you that there was no application for the questions that I asked, which is why is the sky blue? Why is my blood red? Why is this flower green? Uh, I, I, there was no application at all for those questions, right? Um, and all of the applications that we see that come out uh, are a result of uh, uh, basic knowledge that got transformed into some application that is now helping us. Uh, and therefore, this thing of fundamental inquiry is uh, important for the simple reason that it is what makes us human. Um, and uh, it would be great if that could be harnessed in a way uh, that becomes productive. So I think innovation in labs, innovations uh, uh, in universities uh, must have some kind of uh, 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 supportive mechanism to take it out of the lab and bring it to the people. 
so I think both of these uh, things are important. And I want to talk about why study bio life, life sciences. Uh, one thing that I wanted to tell you is that uh, life sciences uh, is generally thought of as the biological sciences, but now we have, it's actually much broader, broader than that. Uh, to do sequencing, uh, which is what uh, 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 Sanjeev spoke about, uh, you needed to have chemistry to do the sequencing. You needed to have computer programs to put things together. You needed to have physics and optics to be able to watch uh, the, the DNA strands grow. So really, we're talking about physical sciences, computational sciences, uh, chemical sciences, all of them having an application in this area that we call the life sciences. So life sciences is all inclusive. Uh, you don't have to be trained as a life science researcher to decide that your expertise can contribute or not. It will contribute uh, in some way. And so I want to, uh, uh, to give you uh, three concrete examples that have come out from this country uh, uh, where innovation, very recent examples, not you know Bose and Raman and all that, you know, these are recent examples in the last five to 10 years that have happened in this country, uh, which came out from basic research, right? And we didn't know that it was going to have an effect in these areas. I'm going to talk about three problems. And I want to tell you that when they started, when the scientists first started doing their work, it was not obvious that this would be the end application. They were looking at something very, very basic. Um, and so, the first application is, uh, why is this, yes. So the first application is, uh, in continuation from the previous uh, uh, session, uh, was an application for farmers. So farmers spray pesticides, uh, mostly to kill the pests that, uh, that uh, attack plants, right? And these pesticides are chemicals that are basically neurotoxins. They go and paralyze and kill uh, the, uh, the pests. But they also work on us because we have the same receptors. They are also toxic to us. So many of our farmers uh, have suffer <laughs> badly. In fact, the reason why they, sit, they drink themselves uh, to uh, oblivion is mostly after they spray uh, pesticides. It's so, uh, it's so toxic, gives them vomiting, diarrhea, uh, uh, terrible uh, pain, uh, that they drink for the, so that they can sleep it off. You know? uh, and so they, have, they really had no technology to protect them from pesticide toxicity when they spray the plants. And so Praveen Kumar Vemula at uh, Instem uh, came up with a molecule which deactivates this neurotoxin. So he has now taken this chemical, uh, which is a molecule that reacts with the neurotoxin, deactivates the neurotoxin, releases, it's, it's a catalytic thing, so it can react with several molecules of neurotoxin. He's now made it into some kind of a gel, which farmers can basically rub on their, themselves. Uh, they now wear protective clothing, which is also coated with this chemical, and masks. And now they're running clinical trials with this. They, they're, and 100% of the farmers have, uh, have, have actually benefited from this. So clinical trials, have go, the trials have gone, field trials have gone really well, and they're now planning to scale this up to affect, uh, to be able to help all the farmers in developing countries who are right now using uh, this kind of a spray technology. And so uh, um, I just wanted to say that at the time that they came up with this molecule, uh, they did not think that this will be the, uh, this will be the end application. And all the three applications that I want to talk to you about are high-end research which is being done in uh, basic science research institutions. Uh, and uh, they are actually going to help people ground up, not uh, the very rich people who will go into, I don't know, Apollo hospitals for uh, some kind of an antibody transfusion. No, this is, these are applications ground up at the grassroots level. Uh, the next thing that I want to talk to you is, I was in the audience when Pradeep at IIT Madras was talking about some new nanostructure that he had made. So these are very, very small particles about the size of a virus um, made from, uh, from uh, inorganic material that has high surface area. And I'll show, talk to you about this later. Um, and these are basically nanoparticles, which he started making on a very large scale uh, uh, and had very interesting properties. It now turns out 
that they can actually bind metal ions. And what he then used it for was to purify water from arsenic and other toxic metal ions. Uh, so the biggest, I remember when I was a PhD student uh, in ISC uh, sitting in a, uh, I heard CNR Rao talking uh, uh, and he said, one of the biggest ways by which you can prevent disease in this country is to provide people clean drinking water. Every Indian should have access to clean drinking water. And so this nanomaterial that was used is basically it's called Amrit technology, which is stands for arsenic and metal removal by Indian technology. And so these nano, this, these uh, porous materials were basically used to, if you pass water through them, it basically filters out these ions and gives you clean, pure drinking water. It's now, uh, just to give you an idea of what this chemical, uh, what this looks like, you can see that the material has got this, uh, uh, you know, uh, very high surface area. And because of this high surface area, uh, it's very efficient at uh, purifying uh, water. And it's now, they've just rolled this out, uh, and it's already been uh, em employed in 20 villages. They're scaling this up. Uh, and hopefully this will be a new way by which uh, many people uh, in our country will have uh, clean drinking water. The last uh, example that I want to give is uh, antibiotic resistance. Many of us are sitting and having antibiotics which are many times wrongly prescribed or we go through the, co we don't even know what antibiotic the person, uh, uh, what microbe is affecting the person. So when the, when the, um, uh, when the affected individual in a village comes all the way to a doctor, he has walked so many uh, hours to reach the doctor. He's not going to come back again. He needs the right diagnosis the first time. So in C camp in uh, Bangalore, uh, they have come up with a method by which within a few uh, hours, you can give a person a uh, diagnosis. You can take their blood, you can culture it, and you can tell them uh, it, within a few hours, you can ask them to wait and tell them that <laughs> Uh, this is the antibiotic you need to use. How does this work? Basically, when bacteria multiply, it results in a change in the acidity around the, the bacterium. And so what the, these researchers in, in C-CAMP are doing is that they uh, are using a pH sensor that my lab had invented, uh, which is sitting in the medium, so that as the bacterium is, in, is uh, dividing, the pH changes, the pH sensor will report it. If the bacterium has been killed by the correct antibiotic, there will be no pH change at all, right? And so this is a way by which you can uh, give a person the right antibiotic for their disease. Um, and at the time that we invented this pH sensor, I can tell you that I never ever imagined that it will be used for something like this. Uh, antibiotic resistance is a very, very big problem in, uh, across the world. This is why we have so many of these superbugs that are coming up, right? Um, and so with this, I'm going to close, uh, close the talk, but I wanted to end with some real examples for you, uh, which came out of pure basic research, which is not just helping uh, a, a particular elite, but is helping everybody ground up. Thank you very much. Before opening, uh, opening it up to all of you, I thought I'd be ask a couple of questions in part actually inspired by things that were discussed this morning. So I think, uh, you know, I hope you will sort of excuse me for sort of taking the first shot at it. The first one, I think, uh, I don't know if it was uh, Kiran Mazun Mazundar who brought it up or uh, somebody else, but this idea um, that undergraduate education and research, typically kind of high-end research, have been effectively decoupled for a long time in, in India. Certainly, you know, I, I'm a product of IIT, you know, god awful years ago. So I think I never, I don't think I understood anything about research, certainly at that time. Um, there are obviously a few new initiatives in there, but I was just curious just if each of you could take a couple of minutes to say what you think uh, about this and what your personal views are on that. Maybe Sanjeev can start since ICERS are maybe a good example. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, the genesis of ICERS was actually precisely for the very same reason that um, we wanted to couple the undergraduate education with high class research. And this was the uh, idea of the think tank uh, led by many other uh, top Indian scientists in the 90s and actually it came about in the year 2006. The first ICERS, uh, ICERS Pune and Kolkata were founded 
followed by many other isers, and now there are seven in the family. So uh, at isers, uh, what is good is that, um, first of all, all the students are taught by scientists who are doing active uh, research. They are not just teachers. They actually do research as major part of their, uh, spend major part of their time. Secondly, uh, the undergrads also have time to spend in the same labs where the researchers work. So the PhD students and postdocs actually rub shoulders with the undergrads and vice versa. So it's not that the undergrads will be shunted to a separate lab where they get only tiny bit of equipment for themselves. They are actually able to use uh, the very same equipment that you saw in my slides and they have access to the same facilities that the other researchers have. So by doing this, uh, basically they can uh, ask some very Im uh, uh, intelligent and very curiosity driven questions which otherwise they are not able to do and at ISERS not just ISER Pune at multiple other ISERS also we have seen that the quality of undergraduate education and their way of addressing various problems has increased tremendously because of this and thirdly uh, by having education in multiple different branches of uh, sciences um, so they all learn physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, uh, earth sciences, and many other, many other topics depending upon different ICERs, and also humanities, they get a very well-rounded education. And uh, this has also made a difference to the way they can ask their research questions. So for example, one undergrad who came to my lab uh, wanted to study some basic uh, properties of an organism, but using biophysical tools, which is something that I myself never thought of doing. So this is how uh, I, can see that I am reinventing re the way in which we can also ask questions. So these undergrads have actually redefined the way research as well as teaching can be done at undergraduate level. Additional thoughts? Thank you. Um, nothing additional, but I think it's, I think uh, apart from just uh, science, I think uh, what's really nice in a university where you have all kinds of uh, disciplines, right? Not just science or only engineering, uh, is that that cross pollination happens much? More. I mean, if that cross pollination happens much more, that's really nice for undergraduates so that they don't think of disciplines because interdisciplinarity is really important for the future. No, I just wanted to say that it, it actually uh, should persist in classrooms uh, where you know when students ask questions, uh, the teacher doesn't take it as an affront, but actually praises the child. And I think the moment we have that, we will have a, a, a we'll be able to encourage critical thinking, uh, whether it's in history or whether it is in geography or whether it is in uh, arts. Uh, we have to be able to question critically. Uh, so I think the moment you do that, you are a scientist. You know. So thank you. Great. Um, I think. Maybe this is, this is a good time, I think, to leave enough time uh, to ask. And I think in the spirit of, I think I don't remember it was Manoj who started this. Uh, I think the first question yes, should yeah. come from uh, somebody under 30, 31. <laughs> <laughs> somebody put, yep. Under 30, but under 35 maybe. So I shouldn't <laughs> disclose fine. that. Uh, okay, so my question is, uh, life sciences is, is relevant and un forms the basis of health and disease, and it's relevant for masses. So um, rather than asking the question, why study life sciences, why not study life sciences, rather? And uh, also, um, how we can uh, simplify science and make it more fun for masses to be engaged it and use it in our uh, daily life. So from the you know, esteemed panel up there, uh, I would want to know the ways we can simplify science, make it fun and usable in our everyday lives to be implicated in health and disease. Maybe I can take that question. So, uh, so when, I, when I'm in the US and uh, I, I get into Uber driver, uh, Ubers, the Uber driver usually asks me like, what do you do? Uh, and I, I say chemistry and then he's like, what? And that's it, the conversation is killed. Uh, but then actually the thing is, uh, if, if the, peop the reason people get very scared about chemistry is actually nothing but the way it's taught. Uh, and usually I tell uh, my Uber driver is that, you know, the process of forming curds from milk is all chemistry, exactly, right? Yeah. Uh, it's all growing microbes and culture. And so if you just say that there's so much chemistry that's happening in your kitchen around you, you just ask why is, how, why is my mayonnaise? the way it is, right? So there's a lot of chemistry that happens around you. Uh, and I think 
just being able to relate the teaching of chemistry to what is there in your daily life is enough to help, uh, I think, uh, uh, kids to look around and ask questions of themselves uh, as, and find the answers. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, part of the reason that there is such a stigma about science is because of the way in which scientists themselves have distanced from the society. Um, if any scientist were to be asked, can you explain what you do in simple words to anybody? It could be an Uber driver or it could be just any other person in the society. Can you really do that? Do you make an effort to do that? Because uh, it's easy to st uh, stand up and give a talk in a scientific conference, but if you want to actually explain what you do in simple words to your brother, your sister, or uh, to anyone else, any lay person, can you actually do that? So. It's first of all, the scientists have to make an effort to engage with the society that will increase the public perception of science as well as uh, understanding of science. And secondly, to put more actively, uh, yesterday um, um, we were discussing with uh, Kiran Mazumdar and she actually uh, talked about some of the new initiatives in the city of Bangalore. Like for example, she also mentioned this morning about this science uh, museum. Okay, so it's like an exploratory where students as well as uh, common people, the whole public can actually go there, engage in doing some cool things in science. So it's all about making science appear and feel cool to people. And if we make that kind of e effort, I'm sure there'll be more acceptance as well as public, uh, I would say, uh, respect towards scientific endeavors. Okay, thank you. I think, I'd, I'd, I mean, the, the difficulty, I think this is true um, everywhere, not just here, um, it's, it's probably true everywhere, which is that it's, it's one thing to say, okay, let's just make science you know, easy to teach, easy, but, but how do we, like, you just said that even scientists, I'll include myself, we're not particularly great at explaining it anything more than our jargony kind of high level way. So if I were to go and teach in high school to inspire people, like early high school in biology, I'm not sure I would be very good at that, right? So how do we now develop a whole cadre of teachers very early on to, to teach in a particularly life sciences, let's say, uh, in a non-memorizing, just factual kind of a way rather than a critical thinking. It's not an easy solution, but it's, it's a, I think it's a collective problem. It's not any one, it's both sides as you pointed out, so. Um, I can give some insights. I, I run, uh, I was an academic uh, before and now I've started a uh, startup. And this is one thing that I find really difficult, how to communicate to an audience, which is probably my consumer at the end of the day. And I have to simplify complex uh, problems that we are trying to solve and uh, sell it to the people. And I find uh, social media and, and the media out there, the communication medium can be really serve, uh, can be used by science to simplify and more scientists and people who understand science should come up and say, because there is lots of misconceptions and bad science out there that is published in media. So there should be more efforts from uh, people in real science to simplify these things. Just, uh, just add that I think um, Vijay's comment this morning of being citizens first uh, was really nice. And I think it's important to also realize that scientists can't do everything. I mean, every scientist can't be a fabulous scientist, amazing communicator, et cetera, et cetera. And so, uh, you know, undergraduates who study science have a scientific temperament uh, and are interested in other kinds of careers in science, which are not necessarily research, I think have a really large role to play. And all of you, right, in science communication as well. Thank you. Uh, hello. Yeah, so uh, Mammy mentioned that uh, all of us are born curious, and uh, you know, I agree with that. And you also mentioned that uh, the education system beats, it up, beats our the curiosity out of us. <laughs> so how do you think can we leverage technology to keep the levels of curiosity constantly up through the system? starting from primary level to the mid level to high school and you know I, uh, uh, meet having major focus on the primary level because that uh, are, I think shaping yours for us yeah so uh, I think that's a great question I just want to say that uh, you know we have this uh, notion that you have you are only an expert if you have been trained uh, to be an expert but one thing that the internet has done is to level uh, uh, 
is to is to level that, right? If you are really interested, you so I, 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 just yesterday, I got an email from a 52-year-old truck driver in Michigan. Uh, this guy writes me an email saying, I have just read this paper in Science by this guy Carlos Morales, uh, and it's on uh, 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 it's on mitochondria, and I'm reminded of your work. Uh, uh, in nature, in uh, on lysosomes, and I wonder uh, whether you can do something for this field. Uh, and I, therefore, I'm I'm sending you this paper in order for you to connect the dots, uh, because I am suffering from a disease, uh, it's a mitochondrial disease. Can you use your technology for mitochondrial diseases? So it's, uh, and actually, I went and looked. There's a very good connection between lysosomes and mitochondria. And I'm thinking this guy is a truck driver. Uh, okay, so. Uh, so we have this thing that you know people who are uh, you know your Uber drivers or your barber or whatever cannot understand science. No, if you have enough motivation, uh, information is out there that you can actually read. Just like us, we also read and get our information when we go into new fields. So I think all that one needs to do is be able to provide the motivation to help uh, people be able to teach themselves. Uh, Right? and then use other people as sounding boards. And that is how actually knowledge is built. So I think we are in a very special time uh, where we have access to information. You don't have to go to have a library close by in order to go and get that information. It's all there at your fingertips. Uh, a follow-up question. Uh, yeah. uh, you, I think you probably should give other people a chance. I think I'm sorry to get here, but I think there's many hands up. So I think I saw somebody else there, and then after that, you. So, yeah. young undergraduates right now, are you seeing any changes because of the fact that now a lot of the students are focusing less on textbooks and more on audiovisual uh, education? So I see it in my younger cousins, I see it in a lot of people around me. The focus, the, prim the primary role of the textbook has moved to AV audiovisual. In India it's Baiju's, in the US it could be Tutor Vista and so on. Is that visible in your interactions with the young undergraduates? Because this is a recent trend, last four or five years. I think the short answer is yes. Yeah. Um, I, think I, think the I thought you were going to ask, like, is this good or bad? And I think that remains to be seen. But I think it's, I think, inevitable. There's a whole slew of people thinking hard about it, how to do this, and active learning, experiential learning. So uh, yeah, I think it's an entire another conversation. So if you don't mind, we'll move on. I think it is true. So I think you had the question, and then I think somebody else over there after that. But uh, his screen first. Our teachers or scientists are not uh, human first. They behave like a terrorist to students. <laughs> <laughs> not only that, if you go to school, college, university, these teachers, so-called, they behave like a god. They are caste-based, class-based. If you go on Mahabharata, how Dronacharya behaved yeah. with this Karana. Yeah. This is still going on in our yeah. society. Yeah. Until we get out this of culture, yeah. nothing will move. Yeah. So culture is much more important than anything else. Yeah. I don't dare comment on that. I mean, I, I mean <laughs> I, you, know, you know, in part because then I have not lived in this country for a while, and I, it would be probably in, inappropriate for me. But I, I think I agree with you. But maybe people comment, here can. I, I just comment briefly. I think that's really important. Uh, the idea of scientific culture. Uh, I come from an institution where no one really bothered what I do or anything, and that's actually very, very liberating. So it's really important to have a culture of freedom for science and innovation. Innovation also whatever you call it, application, whatever it may be, uh, for them to flourish. So I think that's really an important point. Yeah, I think but the question is also about the teacher, so the teacher. The teacher shouldn't behave kind of in this all-knowing, don't question yeah, me, don't yeah, critically yeah. think. And I think this is, of course, absolutely true. And I think, again, this goes down to this cultural thing. It starts at the, the young level. There's a little bit of an easiness, right? If you, if you just teach with nobody questioning you, that, that makes your life so much easier. But if people start questioning you, it's just harder, and I think critical thinking, we were whispering with Sachit earlier today, and uh, I, it's like this idea of critical thinking is good, and I think uh, I, while I agree with Yamana about equalizing with the factual information, I don't know, uh, it sounds a little bit romantic, but science is really a way of thinking, right? It's not just, it's just not f facts. That I think it's, it's just a way of thinking about, like, you know, t testing hypotheses and re rejecting them if it's not true, so I think that, I'm not so sure it's going to just come from factual, you know, surfing, but maybe I'm wrong. I think facts, I think facts.
facts are uh, a construct, and then you ask questions. For example, the sky is blue. That's a fact, right? And then you ask, why is the sky blue? But the, the thing is that you have been exposed to that fact. And so when you are able to access information, which is a set of facts, no. at least you will start asking, why is this like this, yeah. right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I think uh, there should be a way in which now we completely look at this entire question differently. And that is, uh, earlier it was a unilateral transfer. So teacher is giving knowledge to students. And nowadays, I think teaching has completely changed. We have to look at it as a two-way, and it's a co-learning experience. Yes. Because you're not only giving, facts are always there, right? You can read textbooks, you can read papers, you can get whatever knowledge you want. But ultimately, it is the learning. In science, it is the learning that is more important. How to do science, how to think critically, how to ask the questions. And that is where I think it should be a two-way dialogue. And if that transition doesn't happen, then it will always be this one-way thing. And as long as it's one way, it's not going to be fruitful. I perceive the limitation there. I think traditionally in the Indian education system, and maybe in other parts of the world as well, uh, the teaching of science is kind of siloed into physics, chemistry, bio. Yeah. And I feel there are huge interrelationships that actually exist. But for some, and you know, children can actually choose to take physics but not bio and you know, things like that. So I just wanted your comment on that and, and what you feel about that. Uh, sure. So uh, I guess, I mean, this is getting back to what we've been discussing about interdisciplinary approaches to addressing questions, whether they be problems which need to be solved or uh, just questions, right? And I think that you're right. I mean, uh, what Yamuna said about the curiosity being beat out of you, these silos make you think about things only in, you know, stables or whatever. So yeah, of course, I mean, I think that has, but changing that, so for a country, like it's nice to say that, but to change that at a scale of a country like India, the teachers have to be involved. And that whole process of relearning and rethinking about knowledge uh, is a big challenge, but I think it has to be addressed. I think I just feel like I have to also point out one thing, which I certainly growing up here at the time, that there's, uh, there's a little bit of an insecurity when you go into high school or when you go into college. The idea is that you do something that you can get a job, job because yeah. it's not secure. I think, Perhaps the good thing that we're asking all these questions is that maybe part of society here is in a, in a place where maybe that's not immediate. I mean, you, you're kind of confident that you will find something to make a livelihood, and then you're making a choice, what kind of livelihood you want to make. So I think uh, let's just, I shouldn't forget that, right? The fact that why we do one thing very early on, it kind of gets professionalized, and you're going to go be an engineer or a, or a doctor. So I think it's something we have to keep in mind, but hopefully it's much different now. Uh, uh, I think Priya, somebody else is going to have. Okay, sure. Yeah. Uh, you correctly said it was also going on in my mind when uh, you know we think that the basic uh, knowledge starts when you're born and when you start the mothers and the parents give you knowledge. So the practical knowledge when you talk about starts from there. So moral, <coughs> even the moral boosting starts from there, from your home and also the school, which adds on. So if that is also lacking, the parents are running for their incomes, they're running about for their jobs. Both of them are working, they don't give time to the children to give the real right science or probably the knowledge what is required. So combination of the two and the students now think that whatever we are learning should get a good job, how much I can earn out of this knowledge, what you're thinking. The basic knowledge, what you said, that everybody wants to do it, probably the science inside, you know, the scientific, scientific knowledge, what you have inside, you want to become scientists, but the only thing is you don't fetch money out of that. So that is lacking in the education system itself. We grill the children to say, now you should do this course to get a better job or get a good salary. So you're right, and that really, I don't know how in India we can just at our time, we used to always think, we don't know, you know, what we should do to earn the money. We never thought yep. when we started. But now children are totally developed differently. They say, no, you should study, which gives you money. So how that education system should rewind back, how yep. policy or I don't know how government yep. should do it, that has to be answered. Yeah, I think uh, it's, it's a very fair question. I think 
it sounds like it's a little bit outside. It's more a policy kind of a question. Yeah. And I think we can. See perfectly, but yeah, because even teachers no, have I, been forced. I, I just, just, just in, in the purpose of time, if we can ask yeah. a very precise question, what do you want the panelists? The, to how about? how will you uh, rewind the teaching system? Even the okay. teachers have been bound with the policy sure. that you yeah. have to give this. So result. how do you make that actual change that we're yeah. all talking about? Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe Suresh wants to answer this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, since this is a meeting about science and society, yeah. I feel a dire need for, to instill a social conscience for all of our students as well as an ethical conscience because so much of what you see here in, in this incredible rat race that I don't think I would be able to survive in, in a high school anymore or in a college anymore, you find that uh, my fear is that people will cut corners and if they don't have a moral conscience and a social conscience that we will run the risk of uh, making mistakes as a result of that and we don't want a whole generation coming up without that uh, moral compass uh, within them. So I don't know if, if the teaching efforts that are going on include that uh, because there's a lot to do there too. I don't know the answer here, but I think certainly in the U.S., as, as you probably already know, I think you know, particularly in the context of big data and uh, uh, artificial intelligence, this is now, I think, a fundamental issue. How do you teach not just at the high school level, right? This is all, all through level. But the other, maybe one other point just to, uh, before we close, because I think we're getting, uh, getting close, which I think, uh, again, I'm probably, this is counter to probably what many people are thinking. Many of the issues that we've been talking about, just the curiosity, thinking about science, teaching and all that, I have a very hard time believing that these are solvable by developing apps. Because, you know, there's this instinct, right? Everything, as entrepreneurs, what is, oh, is there an app for that? Like, you know, you do this, is there an app for that? And I think that's great for very, you know, kind of the software-driven, information-driven things. And I sort of feel like the life science, this education and mm -hmm. it, it, the interest, uh, the, the moral <laughs> reasoning, I don't know that, it's actually not so clear. What, what the exact direction to do uh, it is. So anyway, that's my, my last word. But I don't know if the panelists want to have a final word before we close the session, just because we have to eat. <laughs> no? So, okay, you can always come and ask us, but I was asked to make one last announcement, which is very unscientific. Said uh, their lunch is served on the ground floor. <laughs> It's probably more informative than anything else you've heard. <laughs> there are six stations of food. You can go to any of them. Two vegetarian stations and four non-vegetarian. <laughs> Please return to the auditorium at 145. Our thermal will kick you out. He didn't say that. Anyway, well, thank you all for listening to us. Thank you.